Levy is an author, healer, and founder of the Awaken in the Dream community in Portland, Oregon. He is also a Tibetan Buddhist practitioner and a longtime student of the work of Carl Jung. And we are so glad to have him join us today. Hi, Paul. Hi. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here with you. Really, thank you for the invite. Uh, absolute pleasure. I'm so excited to speak to you. Um, all things dreams. I know you talk about the dreamlike nature of reality. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could expand on what you mean exactly by that. Yeah, for sure. And so I should just be clear, I'm not talking in this like sort of metaphorical sense, like, oh, this is like a dream. Actually, it was sort of uh, not an argument, but, uh, you know, one place we didn't agree. This very eminent Tibetan Buddhist uh, translator came over my house one day for tea. And um, and the disagreement was he was saying, no, 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 this is like a dream. It's metaphorical. And I was like, no, 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 this is a dream, you know. And why I was saying that it's come out of these experiences that I began having in 1981 in which I began to have the realization that we're having a collectively shared dream. We're dreaming up this universe moment by moment into incarnation, into materialization. And um, and I began having experiences right at that same time that were physically impossible, that could only happen in dreams, particularly when I was around my teachers, who was like getting into their, in, into their force field or gravitational field the third dimensional space-time continuum just warped or something like that. And so I've been over 40 years continually trying to understand and realize and integrate what it means that this is a dream. So I just, that would be the first part that it's, I'm not just talking metaphoric. Okay. And, and, you know, just like in our night dreams, we, in an ordinary night dream, we typically our subjective experience is that, Oh, this universe we're in, is objective and solid and separate. And then it's only at those moments where we have the realization of the nature of our circumstance, i.e. that we're dreaming, that we're inside of our psyche, that we're actually seeing clearly, that we actually recognize the nature of our situation. And we then have this lucidity and then it's a radically different experience. What I'm pointing at is that the same thing is true in our waking life, that just like in a night dream, you can have the recognition that you're dreaming, same thing in the waking dream. And we then can have this, this lucidity. That's not necessarily that hard to do. The, the really, the challenge is to stabilize that realization, both, both in the night dream, because it's easy to get absorbed back in the forms of the dream and in the waking dream to really have that lucidity and to stabilize it and then to integrate everything you're experiencing into that viewpoint, you know, that this is a dream. And I can, I can, we can spend the whole hour just more unfolding what exactly I mean and, and how do I, you know, what does one do with that? Because we can then just like you wake up from a night dream or sometimes even in the night dream, if you have enough lucidity, you can interpret the night dream as you're having it you know, with, with the, the meta awareness that you're dreaming, but typically after you wake up, you interpret your, you know, that, that dream that you just awakened from and you interpret it symbolically because symbols are the language of dreams. Same thing with the waking dream. We can interpret the experiences that we're having in our life and that are playing out on the world stage symbolically as if it's a dream. And, and that's a way of really um, extracting the, the teaching and the message because this universe being dreamlike is an oracle. It's continually speaking to us. And, but if we are entranced in seeing things in a literal way, we continually, we don't see the symbolic nature of reality. And... Yeah, so I can just go on and on, but that's just the littlest bit of what I mean. Well, I'm sure anyone listening, the the first thing that popped into my mind as you were speaking is, would, one, would you be willing to share some of those experiences that you had um, in terms of being with your teachers and having experiences that are just hard to explain? Well, um, yeah, I can, you know, there's one I can talk about, the others you know, I, my inner guidance is like, no, don't, don't talk about this publicly. And I really get that. 
you know, but the one, and I've talked about this a lot, even on different shift interviews, so I won't go into it in that great of a detail, but basically how I had this realization came out of this intense trauma. And so I had this, um, you know, in 1981, in the spring of 1981, this huge awakening. I got, I was, you know, and it was all based on, I was in such deep suffering from the emotional trauma and how I dealt. So I went from being a happy, healthy, you know, I was in my, in my early to mid twenties, I was 24, a happy, healthy person. Then this trauma happened in my family. And, you know, the story isn't important, but it created such suffering that I went from a very accomplished kid to not being able to live my life because the trauma just was like completely overwhelming. And I went inwards. I went into really into my awareness, you know, assuming the position of the witness for hours and hours and hours a day, every day, you know, because that was the only thing that was alleviating the suffering even a little bit. And um, and then I got hit by a bolt of lightning. Just it, it ignited inside of my mind, not an external bolt. And within, you know, right right then, I just went into such an extreme state within the next few hours. And I was beginning to realize, oh my God, this is a collector dream. You're you're my dream character. I'm your dream character. We're all dreaming it up together. This world, this experience, we're not separate. I was snapping out of the separate self because that's another way of articulating what I mean when I say that this is a collective dream. And, and I was so excited and enthusiastic. I was so unprepared for what I was realizing. I mean, I just wanted to share it. And, but from my friend's point of view and from outsider's point of view, it was like having this radical personality change, you know, just overnight. And so I immediately got brought by ambulance to a hospital. And so the, the one experience that I can share is that I, you know, I get put into the psychiatric hospital. It's a little bit after dinner. I'm let into the lounge and there's a woman and she's blind. Her eyes are opaque. You know, it's clear she has no sight. And I just sort of like a heat seeking missile. I just went up to her just intuitively because I was so open. I was like an open instrument for whatever to come through. And I just spontaneously, it was like I was given a script. I spontaneously began saying, all you have to do to see is open your eyes and look. Like these words were just coming through me. It was like, this was the role I prepared for, for like a number of lifetimes. And here I was just playing a role in her dreaming process. I kept on staring in her eyes, getting closer to her, saying those words. And over the course of not even a minute, she regained her sight. And you know, um, and that experience not only saved my life, because then in the next almost two years, I, I had an incredible like propensity to get myself thrown in mental hospitals because I was a free agent having this huge awakening. So maybe like three, four other times I got hospitalized. I always got diagnosed as, oh, you're, you know, whatever they call it then, um, bipolar is what it's called now. And you're going to have this illness the rest of your life. You're going to need to be on medication. And how that experience saved my life. I knew they were crazy. I knew that the psychiatrist had no idea. And, and over 40 years later, I'm still unpacking the insights that were encoded in that experience. Because I realized in that experience is the source of my whole work. You know, I've written books on the mind virus, on, on, on the Watiko, you know, idea of Watiko mind virus. That's in good, that's, which is a self-induced blindness. She was hysterically blind. And, um, you know, and, and I had this realization about that the next day in the hospital with her. But um, also the idea that I just didn't, I didn't heal her blindness. I didn't do anything. All I did was just, I was open. It was like, I was, I was an Uber driver and I got the instructions. So, oh, you know, go to this. You know, I was the one that central casting sent because she was ready to heal her blindness. And she just needed somebody to like, you know, help her and just say these words to remind her that she could heal her own blindness and open her eyes and see. And so, but that encoded in that dynamic is what all of us can do when we're actually out of our narcissistic self-absorbed fixation on that we exist as a separate self. And when we're just open-hearted and an open instrument for whatever healing that wants to happen in the field for us to be, you know, conduits for that. That's all I was doing. I wasn't, I didn't, I don't have any magic powers. No, I was just 
an open instrument. And then she, um, that, you know, our coming together was very synchronistic. Not only did it heal her blindness, it healed something in me, you know? And now that's not this miracle experience. What I was talking about was there were miracle experiences that are physically impossible. That experience with the blind woman was an auspicious coincidence of factors. It's highly improbable, but it's possible that that could happen. But what I'm basically saying is that that coming together of she and I, it was this um, revelation. Something was being revealed, you know, to me. And I'm, I'm still unpacking, you know, the, you know, the profound gifts. But the point is, is that each one of us can really, like what I just unwittingly or, you know, not consciously stepped into by just being available for the healing that wanted to happen in the field, we can all do that for each other and for the world at large. Which is just so incredibly freeing and powerful, especially currently because we're dreaming up a collective nightmare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. No, right. totally. Well, my, you know, the, it's funny because the, the, the tentative title and subtitle, I, I have a new book coming out next year and it, it's basically called Undreaming Watiko, which is the mind virus, ending the collective, ending our collective nightmare. Because, yeah, we are dreaming up a nightmare. You know, this is a collective dream. And I point out, I go into, you know, in my work, I inquire into, well, how come we're doing this? We are literally creating a nightmare where we're enacting collective suicide. You know, we're destroying the biosphere, the life support system of the planet. It's completely clear if you have eyes to see. And I ask the question, how come we're doing that? And I point out in my inquiry, we're doing it because we don't know how not to do it, okay? And what that means, the implication of that is by enacting the self-destruction, encoded in us doing that destructively is the teaching. It's showing us that's the way we're, we're, we're able to learn how to not do it because we clearly haven't understood how not to destroy ourselves or we wouldn't be destroying ourselves. What that means is that encoded in the madness, this is like a key of my whole work, encoded in the pathology and the madness, whether you call it Watiko or whatever, but encoded in our insanity is the actual vaccine, is the medicine, is the healing. And not only that, it, it, it's not just healing the pathology, it actually help, it's helping us to awaken to the dreamlike nature. And when we awaken to the dreamlike nature, that's equivalent to having the recognition of who we are. And what that means, when we have the realization of who we are, well, who are we? That's a catchphrase in, in a lot of spiritual circles. Oh, we need to become who we are, remember who we are. What does that mean? Well, I point out that when you have realization to whatever degree of who you are, our true nature is by its very nature creative. And so when you realize that, what happens? You become creative. And what happens then? The more you become creative and express yourself creatively, the more you know your nature. It's a self-reinforcing positive feedback loop that creates light upon light. And that's available for all of us. You know, and that's when you see this as a dream, the war in Ukraine, COVID, the madness, the evil mm -hmm. that's playing out. What I'm pointing out is that when you, in, like, say if somebody had a dream last night and the dream was what's playing out in the world and they came into my office and they're like, oh, there's this global pandemic and there's this war in Ukraine and we're right on the verge of World War III, how would I interpret that dream? I mean, it's clear to me when you interpret it in a symbolic way that, oh, well, that's reflecting something inside of the dreamer and we are the dreamer. So then the question, what is it reflecting? And I point out that it's showing, you know, whoever the dreamer is, whether it's individual or collectively, that the dreamer is not in touch with their intrinsic creative power. So they've outsourced it. So they've disconnected from it. And then of course it gets picked up by external forces who then they implement it and express it in a way that doesn't serve the dreamer, but serves them. And when enough people are doing that collectively, we dream up 
this nightmare like we're having, but encoded in that is the solution. What that means is that the, the healing, the cure for the madness that we are playing out is for each one of us, because it has to start on an individual level, is to connect with our nature, with our true nature, which is to say, to connect with being creative. So powerful. I think this might be a helpful point to ask. How do you think people can begin to recognize the dream-like nature of reality a bit yeah. more? So, I mean, as you're speaking, I'm hearing you saying implicitly yeah. it's awareness, it's lucidity, but maybe right. you can expand on that. Yeah, 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 sure. And there's all these ways, you know, um, to do that. On the one hand, to connect with your night dreams, you know, because that's when I, you see, when I had my awakening, you know, which was based on such incredible trauma and, um, and then, you know, I, I continually got hospitalized and diagnosed and medicated and it, it was brutal. It was like, you know, I see now, yeah, that was part of the awakening. It wasn't a mistake. I was descending into Hades, into a hell realm and, and just having my mind blown by the madness that you know was getting enacted in in mental health you know which i put in quotes and so when i got out of that last hospital in 82 i was in deep trouble and then i began having these incredible dreams night after night and i didn't know anything about dreams you know but i knew i had to learn the language so i began journaling and writing them down and working with them and now the unconscious is this like it's a reflecting mirror so the attitude we take towards it just reflects back. So if we honor the unconscious and are open and honoring, you know, when we have dreams, then the dreams, you know, they manifest in a way that's worthy of being honored because it's reflecting our own attitude. And so on the one hand, you know, anyway, and you know, I can talk a lot more about this, like putting a notebook by your bed or you know, first thing when you wake up, ask, what was I dreaming? And, you know, and all that. But that changed my life because then I began to get into alignment with, you know, these, with, with my dreams that were speaking in a language I didn't know they were speaking symbolically. And um, so for any one of us to do that would really help because then you start to see the correlation between your night dreams. And, and I do want to talk about this and the, you know, our life, the waking dream. But another very simple practice, like for example, in Tibetan Buddhism, one of the major practices that every practitioner does is called pure perception. And what pure perception basically in essence, I mean, there are all these aspects to it, but in essence, it's going about your waking life and imagining moment by moment that you're dreaming and that you've become lucid and just establishing yourself in, in that point of view. And of course, just to contemplate for a moment, when you're in a dream, and this is the dream that we're having, right? And so just imagine that if you're in a night dream and you all of a sudden start doing a practice of, oh, I'm gonna imagine that I'm dreaming. Well, what's gonna happen? The dream that you're in is gonna reflect that back and it's gonna manifest more dreamlike. And then, it, and so that's the practice. That's the practice of pure perception to continually abide in that viewpoint of that you're dreaming and that you're awakening in the dream. And the more you integrate that viewpoint, the more the dream, night dream or waking dream has no choice because it's a reflection of your own mind to reflect back that realization. Okay. Now, and one, I mean, so I, there are a lot of other ways, though those are really, you know, a couple of very essential ways. But a thing I want to point out is that the, we, we are all co-dreaming. And a way to think about it, a very, I think, good way that a lot of people can, can understand is in intimate relationships. To the extent, or just our good friends and the people in our lives, to the extent that I haven't healed my unhealed abuse and trauma or wounding, I'm unconsciously gonna connect the dots on the waking ink plot, and I'm gonna literally dream up, you know, my unhealed abuse in my relationships and the closer they are, the more this happens. And, um, and then I'm gonna be unwittingly, unconsciously 
dreaming up, creating the very woundedness, you know, that I haven't healed. But then if I don't recognize it, then I'm just going to, you know, react to it and become conditioned by it and re-traumatized by it on and on and on. Now, that experience I'm describing, so that's this, you know, ancestral, multi-generational, unhealed trauma, how to the extent we haven't healed it just gets enacted in our lives. But the way that process works is exactly how a dream is crafted. When you contemplate a dream, what is a dream? A dream is a reflection of the mind. And so if I have an unhealed abuse issue, if I have something unconscious and I go to sleep tonight, what's going to happen? My unhealed trauma and wounding and an abuse issue is, you know, going to literally and symbolically inform and give shape to the night dream I'm having, you know, because what is a dream, but it's an actual unmediated manifestation of the unconscious, but encoded in that unconscious manifestation, it's helping us to become conscious. You see, there's that thing again, encoded in, in one opposite is the other. And um, so the way that when we study our dreams and we begin to, to see the deeper pattern, oh, wow, what dreams are reflecting, that's exactly the way the waking dream works, you know, and, and you know, not just in relationships, but in, in the whole greater body politic, like we are dreaming as a species, this madness, you know, with the war in Ukraine, with COVID, all these things, and that's reflecting something in us. And when you realize that what's happening in the outer world is reflecting what's happening in the psyche of a dreamer, of the dreamer that who is us, what is that describing? That's describing the dreamlike nature. Because think about it, a dream, when you're in a night dream, the outer dream is reflecting the inner process. It's, it's what I like to call, I think, in a way, going from unconscious dreaming to deliberate dreaming. Yeah. And I think when you speak, what comes up for me is that as you talk about it, it's such a freeing pathway because severity and extremes can lessen. So if you're in a deep place of suffering, like you're saying, if you have this avenue or aspect of yourself that you're grappling with and you go to sleep and you have this incredible nightmare where you're actually confronting this part of yourself, the more you're able to do that, the, the easier it becomes because you're starting to pay attention to it. So it doesn't need to be so extreme, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, what typically, and I can talk for me, I have deep experience in this just based on my own suffering and trauma and, you know, unconsciously like playing out my own, you know, unconscious shadow is that um, we all... Um, have in a way this creative tension of the opposites that we're dealing with. And, you know, and I think about, you know, the cross, like Christ being on the cross, you know, when Christ in my next book, I talk about that Christ himself, and it's more in the apocryphal text, was talking about the dreamlike nature. He was basically instructing his disciples to see what came through him symbolically as a dream, right? And that's very interesting. So the cross and the crucifixion is very symbolic. And, um, and what it's symbolic of is holding that tension of the opposites. And it's like a crucifixion. And if, you know, it's, it's very painful, but if we don't develop the container within ourselves, you know, to creatively hold that tension without splitting, without disassociating, if we dissociate, then all of a sudden, say if we prematurely decide on one of the opposites and at the expense of the other, so to say, you know, then we develop a dis-ease in our soul and we become sick and we're colluding in that. But if we're able to develop in a way the courage and the strength and the awareness to hold that creative tension without dissociating, without splitting, and it's painful and, you know, the birth of the self, the incarnation of who we are, you know, it, there's no getting around it. It at some points involves pain. And, but there is a way of holding the pain and holding that tension of the opposites, where instead of developing dis-ease, you know, out of that, something that we couldn't have created by our own egoic self emerges 
Jung, the great psychiatrist, calls it the transcendent function, whose function is helping us to transcend our limited sense of self, or the, the um, reconciling symbol is another phrase he uses. The idea being that, that a symbol emerges, that there's this grace that comes from on high, from a higher dimension of our being, that emerges out of us being able to, with integrity, hold that creative tension. And I'm talking from my own experience. I mean, I've been going through this awakening process for 40 plus years, and a lot of it has been incredibly excruciating, you know? And if somebody could have given me a pill, oh, this will heal your suffering, I would have taken it in a second. But I've learned there's two types of suffering. There is the sort of unproductive suffering, neurotic suffering, like a squirrel in a hamster cage, just going around and around. And there's no, no benefit out of that. And we are actually colluding in enacting and creating yeah. that suffering. And that's just like, you know, being in a black hole and it's tragic. But then like in, in Christianity, they, you know, they'll have these mystics who will talk about then there's suffering that comes from God, so to speak. And that's a suffering that's purifying. And it's really important to differentiate those two types of suffering. Right. And so for the second type of suffering leads to awakening. Yeah. In really other words, it. like Saint John of the Divine, who wrote, you know, the the dark night, you know, of yes. the soul, you know, he talks about the second type of suffering that's purifying. He goes, if you want to make 24 karat gold, you have to put it in a furnace to burn away all the impurities. And I mean, I went through this for years, you know, just the unbelievable over the top. And I'm still a work in progress, as are we all. And it really, really helps to contextualize because it's so seductive to pathologize ourselves and think, well, I'm really screwed up and, you know, I'm in all this pain and, you know, but yet what if the pain are, is like the birth pangs of, of the self? I mean, that's, um, and I think about in the collected works, Jung talks about the birth of the self is always this wounding experience. So the idea is, is that it's through our wounds that the divine emerges in us, that our wounding is this, numinous experience and, and this opens up a whole deeper discussion of the wounded healer and which is sure. you know really the shaman and we're all these wounded healers in training and these shamans in training but the idea is is when we have a wound it's so easy to identify ourselves as a wounded person and then we're caught you know then we're stuck in this limited identity and being dreamlike we will draw all the evidence in, in our universe, in the dream, you know, that proves to us, you know, the point of view we're holding, oh, I'm wounded. And then now I get even, you know, more confirmation of, oh, I'm really screwed up. And the more I identify with being screwed up, being like a dream, the universe then gives us all the evidence in a self-reinforcing feedback loop whose origin is our own mind. You see, and that's pointing at something, that's pointing at the incredible creative agency and power that each of us have because what i was just describing say if you're in a night dream and you're holding a viewpoint in the night dream whatever the viewpoint is well the night dream is just a reflection of your viewpoint so what as soon as you're holding a viewpoint the dream will instantaneously give you all the evidence confirming your viewpoint and if you're not awake to the dreamlike nature then you have proof you have confirmation that whatever you're seeing oh, I'm wounded, oh, the world exists objectively, whatever the point of view, you become even more fixed in thinking you're seeing accurately. And then the more you become, you know, sort of fixed in that viewpoint, the more the dream just reflects back that viewpoint, confirming it, there is the self-reinforcing feedback loop in which we've literally hypnotized ourselves by our own creative agency. You know, and that's why I keep on trying to point people to connect with your dreams to, you know, if you want to realize the dreamlike nature, connect with your night dreams, you know, because it can literally show us the immense creative power that each one of us have in creating our experience of ourselves and of the world. But to the extent we're not awake to that, you know, then what happens is that the world creates our experience for us. And we feel victim, like a victim, and we feel helpless. Yeah. 
How would you recommend that people stabilize? Maybe stabilize is not the right word, but how would you recommend that people stabilize their lucidity or awareness in both both the waking world and the dream yeah. world? Yeah. So on the one hand, you know, the um, historical Buddha, and the word Buddha means, you know, he, he or she who's awakened to the dreamlike nature. That's the translation of the word. Um, he talks about don't hang out with fools. In other words, it's important who you hang out with. You know, the idea of the, 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 the you know, the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, the teacher, teaching, and community, the three jewels. The Sangha is, you know, those are, that's the spiritual community. And when you're hanging out with other people who are awakening, you know, it's a contagious virus in a good way. It actually... Okay. Right. Yeah. It, then all of a sudden we all catch this awakening virus and then you realize it's not a competitive sport. Who's more awake? But if I help you awake, right. because if this is a dream, you're my dream character, which is to say you're not separate, then I get as much benefit as do you. And so on the one hand, it's really important who you hang out with, you know, and um, the other thing and I always get back to this as the medicine, the cure for what ails our species. Like if I were a doctor, you know, or an alien, like an enlightened alien and coming and I was viewing planet earth with the human species, I would die, I would give them this diagnosis of, oh my God, they have this mental virus, you know, and this mental virus has no creativity at all, but it plugs in to the creativity that they're not awake to, and it, it turns it against them. That's the diagnosis. And what the prognosis is, is like, well, whether they're going to survive or not, it all depends if people wake up to their nature, to their true nature as being creative beings. And, um, you know, so to the extent that any of us, you know, can really connect with being creative. And it's always interesting, whenever I do work with people, you know, cause I, I work with a ton of people, invariably i get to that edge of everybody has this vision of what they want to do and oh i'm an artist or i want to create this or that but then they reach their edge which stops them from doing it and it's always a story that they've internalized oh i'm not good enough i'm not smart enough oh i'll be judged you know it won't be perfect or whatever and 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 that's the mind virus right there but you know i i really try to shed light on that because what's basically happening is people are investing that belief or that story with power over them. And then they just feel helpless and they feel, oh, I'm stuck. Well, keep in mind, we can never be stuck. Our nature is, is un, unstuckable or whatever the word would be. You know, we can have this subjective experience of being stuck. You see, we're so incredibly creative that people who, for example, feel, oh, I'm stuck or I'm not creative, what's actually happening is they're accessing their incredible creativity to create the subjective experience that they're not creative and that they're stuck. And that experience that itself is the expression of how incredibly creative they are. But it's tragic if they get caught in creating, some people create that for the rest of their lives. So what I'm talking about, we already have the solution. We've already, we already have the cure for all of the myriad world crises. We are the cure, but we don't know it. You know, it's like this magic wand, like quantum physics has discovered. That's why I, I wrote this book on quantum physics. It shows quantum physics is literally empirically proven and expressing this is a dream. That's, that's in essence, the realization of quantum physics. The act of observing the universe actually influences the universe observed. That's a description of a dream. That's to say the act of observation, how we interpret the dream and, and have this meaning that we place on it, that's literally creative. Our act of observing the dream is creative. We have this enormous creative agency. That's the solution to the world crises for more and more of us individually, because it's not something you do collectively without each individual connecting with the realization and one way to think about this, it's so cool. Imagine, step into our creative imagination and imagine you're having a dream and you have lucidity and you're realizing the dream-like nature of your experience. And then imagine other of your dream characters 
who are just aspects of yourself. Imagine they're also having lucidity and you come together and hang out and you trip out on what you're realizing. Oh my God, this universe we're in, we are literally dreaming it up moment by moment. We didn't know that. When you realize that and then connect collectively with other people who are realizing it, what do you realize? You realize, oh my God, we have the power to change the dream, you know? And I'm talking about a night dream. It's easy to imagine that. That's the nature of our situation in the waking dream. What that means is we are being asked to consciously step in to our own evolutionary process. That's what this is all about. If we don't recognize that, then we're doomed to continue to destroy ourselves, guaranteed. But like encoded in the acting out of our madness, it's actually helping us to wake up to the dreamlike nature. It's such a wake up call. That's exactly it. It's such a large wake up call. It's unavoidable in a way, or it's reaching a peak where, you, you know, people can't avoid it anymore. And I think. Right. Exactly. Right. So yeah, yeah. Um, two things that came up for me whilst you were speaking. The first is that as liberating as it is, I think it also comes with a great sense of responsibility. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for some people that's incredibly frightening because if it is that it's not, it is simple in a, in a beautiful way. It's beautiful because it, we can just shift the dream. We can just shift it with perception. But at the same time, I, there is such an overwhelming responsibility with that. Yeah, yeah. No, there's a total responsibility that that comes with it. You know, that's the that's the cost. And you're totally right. What you're saying, we can't postpone this anymore. Like a lot of us, we've been, oh, manana, I'll do, you know, my Lama calls it manana practice. You know, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll deal with my shadow tomorrow. And we're always putting it off. And, and the dream, the waking dream more and more is manifesting going, no, there's no more time to avoid being in relationship with yourself. You know, it's really placing a demand that we have to look at our own stuff. And everybody I work with, I mean, I'm just amazed. Everybody's stuff is coming up and playing out and, and it's confronting them right in their face. And yeah, there is no time to waste. And the thing is, this, you know, in quantum physics talks about this, that, you know, the future isn't written in stone. It's, it's you know, it's probabilistic. So we could, um, you know, just destroy ourselves. And then I point out, it's like we're having this recurring dream and we've had this again and again, and we've done this a million times and we've continually destroyed ourselves, you know, and then, you know, the biosphere will just regenerate over billions of years. And I imagine we'll be back at the same point. And in a dream, there's no time at all. So that happens yeah. in the twinkling of an eye. And, and then, well, what about the next time? Will we then awaken in time to avert destroying ourselves? Well, what about if that next time when we awaken is this time? What if we actually awaken in time? You know, so being a quantum world encoded in what's happening, yeah, is the very real possibility that we're going to destroy ourselves. Absolutely. Or there's the possibility that we can awaken. And, you know, and quantum physics, it's so inspiring because it's basically saying each and every moment, like a quantum entity, there is incredible potentiality of how it will manifest. And it's a function. It depends on how we observe it, how we dream it. And as soon as we interpret it or observe the universe in this moment, in a certain way, all of those potentialities disappear except for one, which is the actuality you know, as if they go into a, a parallel world, as if they never existed. And then the next moment, the same thing. We, each moment we're presented with these, you know, incredible potentialities. And the point is this, is that quantum physics, and this isn't me, this, these are the most rigorous, you know, brilliant, you know, cutting edge quantum physicists are saying, even if one of those potentialities is highly, ridiculously unlikely, it could manifest yeah. this very moment. Yeah. And that's what was happening to me in my awakening when I was referencing those impossible things. It was like I was having these quantum jumps where one moment, I mean, think about it, that experience with a blind woman. And that was a minor experience yeah. compared to the other stuff that I can't, that I don't talk about. But all of a sudden I was living in a universe where that could happen. Well, and then all of a sudden. You're in, you're in alignment with that 
vision in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and yeah. and even even more, you know, the stuff that that was actually shown to me through the miracle experiences that were impossible, it made me, you know, I mean, it's taken me 40 plus years of deciphering and I'm still decoding. I'll be talking about it in my next book actually because I'm having deep I can't wait to read. realizations. Yeah, and the thing is is that it's it's showing what is it expands the realm of the possible that we've all been entrained and entranced and conditioned to think oh this is possible over here but all of this is impossible and one of the ways of describing the experiences i was having is that you know i'm kind of a slow learner it's taken me 40 plus years but i'm more and more understanding wow the realm of the possible is is wider and more expansive than I had ever imagined. And that means that even that our species could awaken in time and become the instruments for this worldwide global awakening to happen. Quantum physics is saying that's within the realm of the, poss of the possible. And that if you're not thinking that, you see, if you're just, oh, I'm despairing and pessimistic and we're going to hell in a handbasket, then we're part of the problem. Then we're going to dream up evidence confirming that point of view. But quantum physics is saying if you're not really investing your energy in creating the world we want to live in and seeing the incredible possibility of us awakening and our awakening going viral, you know, and it being a contagious, you know, not disease, but whatever the opposite of that is, you know, healing nectar, you know, that quantum physics is saying is completely 100% within the realm of the possible. And if you're not thinking about that, then what are you thinking? Yeah. And so focusing on life-giving creativity as, as opposed to self-destructive creativity Right. That's the, that's it because it's the same energy, yeah. you know, and um, you know, it's a known thing that in the realm of psyche, that the greatest poison in the realm of psyche is unexpressed creativity. I mean, it's what Christ was saying in the apocryphal text. If you bring forth what's within you, it'll save you. If you don't bring forth what's, what's within you, it'll destroy you. It's exactly the same thing. So that energy that potentially would inform the most sublime creativity to come through you if for whatever reason you feel like no i can't do that you know and then that becomes internalized and that gets rendered in the unconscious to the point that it's chronic yeah then you become sick really but the idea is is that the same energy that's potentially you know um informing that destructive energy is available for creativity and then that same energy becomes medicine. And that's the medicine that heals the mind virus and that helps us to awaken. So amazing. So inspiring, actually. So before we end off, is there what what is what would you like to leave this audience with? Is there anything specific that you would sure, like to sure, do? totally. So, you know, and I'm not talking as any, even though I write books and I'm kind of a nerd in that I'm I really study a lot. I'm not any scholar or academic. What I'm saying has come out of like this 40 plus years process 24-7 of going through the most unbelievable ordeal that I more and more realize is initiatory. And it's helped me to find my vocation and find my voice and find my calling. And that's the idea for all of us. We all, it's not an accident that we've incarnated in this world at this time. You know, we all have a mission. And even if the mission, you know, it's not like you have to write books, you just to be a good person and all that, that could be your, you know, what you're here to do. But the idea is we all have a calling. Think about a shaman. They never, you know, decide consciously, oh, I want to become a shaman. No, they get called, you know, and the thing, the real danger, you see, there's a couple of dangers. One is, um, you know, if we, if we don't agree to the calling and say, no, 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 I can't do that. Well, then the shaman typically, you know, gets really sick, goes crazy, dies. So on the one hand, it's really important if you're being called to something to have the courage to assent. The other two dangers are you know, people who just, oh, I'm, I'm a shaman and they have no idea what they're doing and they have no idea um, of the powers that they're dealing with. 
you know, and then they can really hurt themselves and hurt other people. But the other danger is really interesting. The other danger is for us to be ignorant of our shamanic gifts. And we're all these shaman, because the shaman is a wounded healer. And the idea of that archetype is instead of compartmentalizing the wound to go through it consciously, that's the portal to access our gifts. And that's the shamanic trip. And the great danger is for us to like be ignorant of our, you know, shamanic, um, you know, gifts and healing abilities. And, um, and then, you know, typically in the mythology, the, or the shaman, after descending into the underworld through that experience has a gift, you know, that helps the whole world. And, and so to have the courage, you know, because we're all shamans in training, and I, I've written about that, I've given big classes about that, I could say a lot more about that. But the one final thing is compassion. Because when you realize the dreamlike nature, in Buddhism, they say true awakening is always the co-joining of two factors of emptiness and compassion. Well, what is emptiness? In a way, that's, that's having lucidity. That's to realize there's no objective, independent, intrinsically existing world outside of us, that our consciousness is part of the world and we're influencing the world by the way we observe it. That's the emptiness, okay? There's nothing outside of us that's objective. You know, and um, of course, when we realize there's nothing outside of us that's objective, that shines light on the subject and who are we in all of this? And that's a whole other, you know, discussion. But the idea is when you realize emptiness, the natural expression of that realization is compassion. Okay. And so compassion is the dissolver of the mind virus of Watiko par excellence. So if people ask me, what is the simplest way? And really the most powerful way of developing, you know, the realization of the dreamlike nature, I would say cultivating compassion because compassion comes out of the realization that we're not separate. See, the whole mind virus is about being identified with a separate self. And, you know, if I am identified with a separate self, you are other, if you're other, there's fear, fears, the superfood for the mind virus. Okay, but if I have the realization, wow, deep down in the reality sense, where we depend on each other for our own well being, we're interconnected. You know, this is a, a quantum world, there's no separate parts, we're all parts of each other. The, out of that realization comes compassion, and compassion is the greatest healer and it's the greatest stimulant for lucidity, for recognizing the dreamlike nature. So, that's what I would like to end with. That's, a, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your wisdom on this summit. Oh, it's totally my pleasure. Really just can't thank you enough. Thank you. Thank you, Paul.